Well, as I said, Mitch, I'm so happy to have you here. You're my first podcast of 2023, which I think is a really great way to start the year. Sweet. Glad to be here. There's so many different ways we can go. But what pops into your mind first? What are well, you doing? we were we were we were just talking about the the crisis of uh, academia and the esoteric. So, since I'm fresh off that off mic discussion, I'll I'll bring it up to kick things off. You, you know, th- there has been a flowering recently of really great study of the esoteric and academia. I'm thinking specifically of the work being done by. Uh, Jeff Kripal and April DeConnick at Rice University, and there's other work done. But there is a inevitable poverty of that work, inquiries into the occult, the spiritual, the esoteric within academia, because very often, as with a good deal of mainstream media, uh, claims of disbelief are the ticket to entry. And there are some uh, scholars of the esoteric who I know in private actually do engage on a believing scale, as I do. I call myself a believing historian. But in public, they disengage from that as a kind of fee of entry to the academic nomenclature. And it's a it's a very, very tough spot to be in. And uh, I think it should give people pause who are embarking on those careers, whether that's a price they want to pay. Yeah, as I said, it's I feel like it's so deadening because the university, it's like you can be studying these kind of subversive fields, be it occultism or psychoanalysis, but it, you're doing it in a university setting, which are these huge corporations that like pretend to be about learning, but really they're about the bottom line. Absolutely. And we lost, we lost uh, the philosopher Jacob Needleman several weeks ago, and uh, I wrote a tribute to Jerry on Medium called What We Lost When We Lost Jacob Needleman. And he was educated at what are considered the finest universities in the US and Europe. And he said to me, all the years that I was studying religion, esotericism and so forth, never once did any of my instructors broach the possibility that any of these ideas could actually be true and could have practical application to the life of the individual. And Jerry taught as a believing philosopher, as a believing instructor. And I think it it proved very difficult for him. Uh, he, he had so many accomplishments, so many accomplishments, but a pain that he sustained throughout much of his career, and I read about this in the piece, was that he was not accepted within much of lettered culture here in the United States. And prominent reviews, reviews in opinion-shaping journals were very, very rare. And part of the reason Jerry was not accepted was because he did write from that place of authentic inquiry, of not only respect for, but engagement with the religious traditions. And maybe it's changing a little bit, but during the majority of his career, Unless you were coming from a very, very particular place within the Abrahamic traditions, or unless you were coming from a kind of very psychologically informed Buddhism, profession of belief was a bar of entry to a great deal of lettered culture. And that was a sorrow that you know he had to carry with him throughout a, a good part of his career. Yeah, that is such a good point because Carl and I were talking about this the other day. And like he said, you know, when he was when it was his time to go to university, there was no like studies of Western esotericism like there is now. Like it's become a big kind of field. And it's like we were so excited to see it like coming into prominence in academia and having a place and having departments open. But I've quickly like become so saddened to see how like it's become dead. And like you said, you have to come from a prescribed, like socially acceptable point of view, whether it's like the Abrahamic traditions or like just looking at all of the deities and everything as like psychological constructs, you know? Right, and if it's right. not coming from those kind of socially condoned places, then, you know, you're written off as like batshit or whatever. Exactly. And even the, you know, it, going to an adjacent field, the question of uh, UFOs or extra physical encounters, the late John Mack at Harvard suffered terrible calumny for interviewing uh, people who reported abduction experiences. And Mack's position was, look, as a psychiatrist who specializes in trauma, 
using the tools of my field, the only conclusion I can reach is that these people are telling the truth. If you want something different, go to a different researcher. But this is my field. This is what I do. And he suffered just terrible, terrible pushback for it. And as I was saying to you before we began, I was recently watching a four-part series on the channel Showtime on uh, UFOs. In fact, it's it's called UFOs. And I liked it. Uh, and there were some very good people interviewed on it, including uh, Leslie Keen, who I have tremendous admiration for, Ralph Blumenthal, uh, Helene Cooper. They were the three who broke kind of the UFO Pentagon story on the front page of the New York Times in 2017. And they are all actively engaged with the UFO question. They interviewed also as part of the show a couple of academics, one of whom studies um, UFOs as a social phenomena. And she referenced abductees or uh, those who, who report abduction experiences as crackpots. Uh, that was the word used. Uh, maybe she said other things that were more leavened, uh, that were more generous in terms of inquiry off camera, but that's what made it on camera. And when I watch something like that, I'm returned to what we were just discussing. I think people say things like that, not necessarily because that's their ironclad point of view, but because they want to signal to their other academic colleagues, look, I know I'm studying an outsider field, but I'm not one of them. Rest assured, you know, I'm sipping my coffee at conferences with the rest of you, and uh, I I'm not someone who can be lumped in with what I'm studying. And I think there are ways to signal that that are appropriate if they're true. But what's not appropriate is using language of disparity that just reinforces this really fading mainstream opinion that's no longer sustainable, that anybody who reports something outside of commonly observed experience can just be uh, wiped off the margins, maybe considered uh, from an anthropological perspective or from a sociological perspective, but not taken seriously as individuals. And look, that point of view is is fading. It's going to stick around for a long time, but it's it's fraying because the, 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 these experiences are just too common among the public uh, for that kind of uh, slang dismissal uh, to be sustained. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in, in my practice as a psychologist, psychoanalyst, it's like everybody has some sort of experience that's like not acceptable. Like, and they always have to preface it. And it always makes me so sad. And people are like, I know this sounds crazy, but da 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 da. Or like, I don't want you to think, you know, I don't want you to think I'm crazy. And, you know, because people get locked up for these kinds of things, these ideas. Yeah. And it's really, it's really just tragic. And like Freud himself, he, he used to uh, do thought transference experiments, you yes. know, with his colleagues and had to keep them quiet because he wanted to make sure that psychoanalysis was like accepted medically. Yes. And I'm really glad you brought that up uh, apropos of Freud. I'm writing a new book right now called Modern Occultism, which is a massive book. It's a history of the occult from literally Cleopatra to chaos magic. And um, I'm not sleeping much these days. Um a lot of caffeine going into that book. But I do write about Freud's very deep and distinct interest in telepathy and ESP and how ingenuously he spoke and wrote about it. People in our culture continue to have this misperception of Freud as this ardent materialist. And while he did, as you were alluding, do things to cement psychoanalysis's place uh, 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 within mainstream medicine, mainstream therapy, from his early in his career as a young man, uh, when he was a, an early member of the Society for Psychical Research in both the U.S. and Britain, and later in his career, he continued to write and talk about these subject matters. And as you're probably aware, his British biographer, Ernest Jones, uh, complained to him and said, look, if you're talking or publishing on this material, you're validating the claims of the occultists. And Freud wrote back to him and said, it's first steps that matter. Everything else follows. Let's be ingenuous in reportage. Let's let's be forthright in reportage of our impressions, of our experiences, of our clinical episodes. And 
people can make of it what they will. But Freud refused to get into this back and forth about whether or not it was going to validate the occult. And I I, I quote that in the book. I, I write about that aspect of his career. And it's so important for us to recover that and not forget it, or we're just walking around with amnesia. Totally. And the, the the way that things get kind of squashed so quickly is like uh, psychoanalysis, as much as you wanted to be mainstream, it like had such a f flurry and then it gets just kind of completely put down again. And even with like the feeling of the academic, studying the esoteric and the academic, it's like, oh, it's such an opportunity. But then immediately, like people don't want to deal with it as something that's like real. It just becomes like anthropology, you know, and it's amazing how people quickly as a group, a society, like squash these ideas that are really subversive or do, in my opinion, there's there are parts of people that have such agency for ourselves and it's like the collective control or whatever you want to call it just immediately shuts down like people's innate like human agency that that's inherently magical in my opinion yes i think i think that's that's great insight and sometime uh maybe in years ahead i think we're going to see in mainstream fields greater room made for that i mean we're seeing it in the culture right now i think uh ardent materialism um the insistency that uh one disclaim belief i, I think those things are starting to fray uh they're going to stick around for a long time in media and elsewhere but i think they're starting to fray and in academia itself thanks to the efforts of people like um Jacob Needleman, Jeff Kripal, April DeConnick, who I mentioned earlier, uh, and others, and others. Uh, there, there is a willingness to consider esoterica on its own merits uh, within academia. And that's where the action is occurring. So if somebody's going down that path, uh, go to Rice University and hang out with Jeff and April because there's amazing things happening there. I'm really excited for this new book on modern magic. Yeah, I am uh, hard at work on it. it. It consists of 12 chapters. I have drafted uh, nine of the 12. And you probably have had the experience in a book where you hit this point of fatigue. And I'm looking, I'm looking for a new way in as I'm crafting these final chapters. And that way is usually through my attraction to the persona that I'm writing about. It's 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 human stories and it's these kind of stories of how can I put it, kind of intellectual epiphany that become meaningful to me and what moved the individual in this direction. Freud is a perfect example. As a young man, he developed an interest, as did many clinicians of his era, in ESP and telepathy. He you know, the story, the traditional story of Freud is always that, oh, he broke with Jung and Jung was the more occult one and Freud was the more materialist one. And as always with shorthanded history, it doesn't it doesn't really get at it. And I'm always interested in how people encountered an idea when they were young or not young, whatever age in life, and they were suddenly ignited by it and said, I'm I'm not dismissing this. I'm not hiding this. I'm not throwing this away. I, I find that when people write about outsider figures, particularly occult figures, and I discovered this very early in my writing career, they tend to develop either a contempt for them or an affection for them. And both have their pitfalls. Obviously, developing contempt for your subject is to write from a very, very dead place, to use your phrase. And you, page after page after page gets written from this sardonic remove without ever justifying what your objection precisely is, but just deferring to the fact that, well, we all know that blank. And Oxford University Press published a whole book on Oprah Winfrey that was written from that perspective. Uh, the, the author obviously had a certain contempt for what she perceived as Oprah's new age dalliances. And, and just every line was written with from a sardonic remove without ever defining what is it that you're unhappy about here? What is it that you find objecting in, in, in her new age spirituality? Then from the other perspective, which tends to be mine, 
uh, one develops an affection for these figures. And that too obviously has its pitfalls. And I don't want to be perfuming or whitewashing when somebody stumbled, failed, did something grotesque or objectionable. You know, that has to be part of the story too. So I'm always trying to wrestle with that in in a in a in a way that I, I hope challenges my own points of view. Yeah, and you always weave in kind of your experience as well, which I think is really helpful for people to see like how your your journey as a seeker, as you call yourself, you know, and and how that's been and how, you know, you can change your ideas along the way and discover yep. new things and take new routes and kind of obstacles that you've come up against and that, that kind of thing. Yeah, and th th that's proven true in my own experience, and that's thanks uh, in large measure to Carl, you know, when when I encountered his book, A Culture, uh, in fall of 2017, I felt, frankly, that my search was getting kind of stale. There was a repetition of ideas. There was a repetition of statements that I didn't like. And I've we've spoken about this before, but when I encountered Carl's chapter on the magical intellect of Anton LaVey, I saw this and... I had this experience that I'm sure many of your listeners can relate to. The moment I saw that chapter, knowing Carl's intellectual gravitas, I said to myself, there's something here that's going to be profoundly changing to me. And I read that chapter and all my stereotype views of Anton went out the window. And suddenly I was encountering this figure who was much richer, fuller, more interesting, more challenging than I had previously thought. And it marked a great change in my path, which has continued. No, I think it's a perfect example, LeVay as a person and also Satanism in general. Like mm -hmm. just the other day, I got an Instagram message that someone said like, I have to ask, is it true you're in a satanic cult? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, yes. Jesus, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. like, I think that's emerging between like Satanism and having like Blanche on the podcast and Carl, obviously, and then like the occult, you know what I mean? It's like the only Satanic cult I know is like the, the Christian church, you know, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's just like, uh, like Blanche said, when I had her on, it's like, uh, if you have such a reaction, knee jerk reaction to this word, Satan and Satanism, it's like, think about how many other words that you're having having knee-jerk reactions to and not really thinking about you know what they mean or why you're having the thought or the reaction that you're having when you're encountered with these signifiers you know that's a wonderfully put and I am very open to speaking about my dedication to Satanism and my definitions and my understanding of that and I find that there are different ways that this gets processed uh in the media. Some hosts will never bring it up. You know, they've read my books, there are references in there, and they just stay off the topic. And that's fine if they don't want to discuss it. I mean, I'm not, you know, there's no particular box I have to check. Um, some, a small number, take umbrage at it. And I do find, frankly, that there are some cases where people will ask me about it. And again, I'm always willing to discuss it, but I don't want to start to get into that repetitive pattern where I'm giving a stump speech and I'm explaining myself over and over. I find on social media, for example, there are some people who have asked me questions, usually coming from a place of negativity, sometimes mild negativity, but obviously they're they're looking askance at this, which is understandable given all the cultural mistakes and errors and the nature of our, our history. And I will offer a clarifying explanation. And I know that they've read my books because sometimes they'll make reference to them or what have you. And yet the same question comes up over and over again. And that's the kind of exchange I don't want to get into. Um, I guess, you know, as my partner Jacqueline Castell puts it, people either get it or they don't. And I find that, uh, again, I'm always willing to explain it and I'm not naive or impatient with the cultural misunderstandings because it's just the nature of the water we're swimming in. But an exchange needs to be a real exchange. If someone doesn't like something, they're free not to like something. If someone rejects something, they're free to reject it. But we shouldn't mask those responses behind 
drawn out or repetitive exchanges uh because i'm not really going to change what i say very much and um and i don't want to get into uh repetition as a matter of rote nor do i want to bring to bear on the exchange the notion that you or i or carl or blanche or somebody else always has to explain themselves you know there's a certain point past which that starts to become um just a position and i'm not here to articulate a position i'm here to search yeah, exactly. And you don't want to be put in this defensive position of, like you said, of having yeah. to explain yourself all the time, you know, it's like, yeah. go read my books or my Medium articles. <laughs> right, right. You might like them, you might not like them, you might be indifferent, you know, but they're all there, you know. Absolutely. Um, but I think lately, especially with, you know, so many people and even, and even the mainstream now are talking about like, like decolonizing things and um, having more like diversity and uh, indigenous practices and occult practices, uh, uh, which are often, were often indigenous practices were also kind of thrown into the occult practices. Um, things that have been kind of cut out of mainstream acceptance are now like making their way back in. And I feel like uh, one way I've been able to explain it is like, well, if you think of the biblical God, he's like, he's like, he's like the ultimate colonizer. He's like, this, like mm -hmm. you know, very like patriarchal authoritarian figure with like one point of view. And if you don't submit to his point of view, you know, you're out, you're out to hell for all eternity. You know? mm -hmm. And if you think of like Satan and Lucifer and Lilith and these characters as like, you know, being against that or having their own mind and their own way of thinking, I think it can help people to understand a lot better. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's it's just a fact of religious history throughout time, as long as we've had recorded time and beyond, and, and beyond that, religion has always been a, a pastiche. It's always every religion, you peel back a single layer and you find such a diffusion of influences. Uh, I, I literally couldn't name a known a faith, either ancient or contemporary, of which that's that's not true. Uh, religions are like sausages, you know, and a lot of stuff gets mixed up in there. And I think it's time that we, as a human community, accept that as as part of the religious story as well. Nothing was just born fully formed. Every religious movement, either the ancient traditions or contemporary remakings or novelties or new religious movements, they're all a pastiche of different aspects. Uh, you know, Mormonism is a wonderful example. Joseph Smith was interested in, in Freemasonry. He was interested in Kabbalah in as much as he could lay his hands on pertinent material. He was interested in the folklore of the central New York region that he came from. He was obviously interested in Christianity. He was interested in mesmerism and seership. And it's a whole pastiche of things. And we know that because Mormonism is a relatively recent faith, but it repeats the story in a sense of, of all faiths. And uh, that's who we are. That's who we are as a, as a human species. Totally. And I also love in something I was reading of yours today, I think it was about being the rebel uh, in, in the culture today. And you talked about how bullies kind of always make you feel like you have to work on their terms or live on their terms, but that we don't actually have to live on the bullies terms or the mainstream culture's terms, you know? Yeah. The bully always has plausible denial. And, um, the bully is, of course, always his or her own hero, as we all are. You know, we all have a hero staring back at us in the mirror when we when we gaze in it. And I think it's imperative for people to at least exercise the option, understand the option, that they don't have to be around people who are tormenting of whatever whatever intimacy they might have had with that person. Uh, whether it's a family member, an in-law, what have you. My perspective is that we as a culture have not done enough to highlight the problem of human cruelty, including the cruelty that usually comes in the form of subtle takedowns, subtle insults, backhanded remarks and such, which a lot of people suffer the consequences of. 
And then they damn themselves afterwards and say to themselves, oh, I should have said this or I should have said that. And that's really hard for us as a, as as human beings because emotion moves faster than thought, which is why we often think of the brilliant rejoinder five minutes later or 15 minutes later, you know, after we realize that we've been insulted or something. And if a person is locked into those kinds of relationships, and many people are, um, they really ought to feel free to exercise the option of just leaving, separating completely. I think, frankly, some of us have too many relationships in life, and it can get very messy, and it can get very difficult. I have very few relationships. <laughs> I have very few friends. I have a partner. I have two uh, children. I, I care about them very deeply. Uh, beyond that, the list gets really quite narrow, and I don't feel this need to be out there in the world collecting uh, relationships, and I want to be sure that those that I have are mutually nurturing and positive for everybody involved, and um, I think people feel uh, inordinately pressured to have more relationships or to hang out in larger groups, maybe at holidays or gatherings or whatever, than they really want to. And I think people should be really free to re-examine that and separate from things that prove depleting. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, uh, I don't know, to me, I really don't like Christianity. <laughs> I'll just talk mm -hmm. about that too. But I think it comes to this kind of ethic where you're supposed to like deplete yourself for others or sacrifice yourself for others. And also like, uh give people like endless forgiveness you know and it's like if somebody yeah. fucks you over you know they're gonna do it again and again and Absolutely. again as many times as you let them so shouldn't we be teaching kids like that like don't put up with this kind of behavior rather than like give them the other cheek kind of thing you know i agree i i have an essay in my new book on certain places uh and it is it, it's called against tradition but it's really a dissent from forgiveness. There may be a time and a place where forgiveness is appropriate, and that is entirely up to the individual. But I've wrestled with this for many, many years, and I came to feel that the imperative to forgive can be terribly unnatural and burdensome. Now, if someone suffers a wrong, they might use that suffering, abide that suffering to improve something in their lives, to improve something about the quality of people who they permit into their lives. But as you said so rightly, if someone does something terrible, the overwhelming likelihood is they're going to do it again. Human nature, if nothing else, is consistent. And change does occur, but it's rare, unfortunately. And it took me so many years to learn that lesson because I would make the same mistakes over and over and over. I published a book back in my publishing days by uh, Richard Smoley, a very dear friend and an uh, influence called The Deal. And Richard's book, The Deal, was in some respects a kind of a distillation of ideas on forgiveness from A Course in Miracles. Now, A Course in Miracles is very, very heavily based in forgiveness. And Richard's book is, is brilliant on its own terms. If a person wants to explore the question of forgiveness um, and is dedicated to that, there is no other book than Richard's that I could recommend more highly. Uh, it's written with total integrity, and I absolutely honor his search, and I see the fruits of his search in his own character. Personally speaking, I spent seven years working with that book, and I came to a place that this path, this idea of forgiveness as an absolute principle is not for me. I And I can't fathom that my life is exceptional, that my experiences are different from everybody else's. I made that choice, and I made it as a considered choice after spending seven years working with his very brilliant book, I came to a different position, even though he's been a wonderful influence on me and continues to be. And I think that people just need to feel very, very flexible. We repeat things by rote because they are so overwhelmingly familiar. 
And as I often say, familiarity is not truth. And so ideas that emerge, say, from Christianity or the Abrahamic religious traditions, they've been repeated to us in the West for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years so that we feel that they're this, this fixed compass point of truth pointing in this absolute direction that's settled. And of course, that, that that's not the case. These things are just conceptual. Every religion was crafted by human hands, was responding to the needs of people in power or not in power, and, and, and it has a cultural time and place. And basing one's life on decisions that have been made by someone else can be a terrible box and corner uh, to paint yourself into. So it's been a big issue for me personally over the past year, two years, to really try to look at the way in which some of this Abrahamic religious language, as well as language from the Vedic traditions, have been so repeated and so concretized in our culture that they present these this perimeter of limits within which the individual is expected to function and they produce a lot of repetition a lot of concepts that even on the alternative spiritual scene people are almost shackled by in such a way that there's not a vocabulary to speak outside of it, to think outside of it, which is one of the reasons why I really celebrate Anton LaVey's work, because questions of Satanism, whether one comes from a more material direction or a more extra physical direction as I do, they can represent for the individual. There's a lot of integrity and a lot of differences within following that outlook but it can represent for the individual, at least as it has for me, the opening crack of saying, I don't need to accept conceptualizations that have been presented as absolutes. That's been my experience. And it all comes down to my wish that people feel flexible in their approach, that there isn't this one size fits all uh, ethic for everybody. And it was funny that my favorite response I got on this piece uh, in opposition to forgiveness, uh, I got some pushback, but I got a wonderful note from a woman who said, this is exactly my point of view. I'm so glad you expressed it. And anytime I express it, I find that people get agitated with me, even if they have no connection whatsoever to the situation that I'm talking about, as if it's this article of faith that we all have to uh, buy into. And I, I just want us to think flexibly. Yeah, and I love this example too that you talked about of like having someone you admire and reading their work, but then coming to a different point of view or deciding that you don't agree with everything. I think that's really essential too, because I feel like our culture is also set up so much for people to accept these kinds of things that are presented to us, whether they're like cultural norms or just like information from like a mentor or a master or whatever. Um, but I really feel like the, the best thing to do is to kind of help people decide for themselves or figure out what they believe based on like their feelings, their intuition, their experiences. And that's why, like, like you said, it's so important not to negate people's experiences or call them crackpots or these kind of things. Because, you know, everybody needs to learn to trust their experience and not just trust what other people tell them is okay, you know? Yes. And I was, I made a comment the other day on Twitter, the porch of the Stoics, where I said, you know, everybody, we all agree with the principle that it's good to read things or encounter things with which one disagrees, but we very, very rarely actually practice it. It's one of those things that we all nod in agreement with, like, right, wash your hands, eat your vegetables, but none of us actually practice this ethic, or few of us do. And William Blake wrote, opposition is true friendship in the marriage of heaven and hell. But it seems to me that for that to be true, and I do think that's true, I do think opposition is refining, but for that to be true, it has to be formidable opposition. It has to be something that 
is powerfully enunciated and that you really sit with and that you come to your own perspective on. So I really do encourage people, not just as some sort of sentiment or as some uh, throwaway ethic not to really act on, to read and encounter things with which they disagree, but they must be works of of excellence. They must be things that are really going to challenge you. You know, so for me, that might be a Christian writer like C.S. Lewis, uh, or that that might be uh, someone like Ayn Rand, whose economic ideas I don't agree with, but whose persona I'm admittedly very smitten with. I mean, she was a protean, self-created individual, much like Madame H.P. Blavatsky. Um, there was a, a academic named Donald Meyer who wrote an extremely well-researched book pissing on the positive thinking tradition, which I care about very deeply. But the difference was that Meyer's book was uniquely well-researched and that he had read this material with great and evident care. And the same is true of Christopher Lash. In my book, um, Daydream Believer, I dedicate a whole chapter to responding to Christopher Lash's very formidable critique of New Age culture. I want there to be formidable opposition. I want to engage with it, I seek it out, but it it has to be something that has real solidity. And that's the point at which opposition becomes friendship. Yeah, and like you said, something that's actually well-researched and people have really thought about it, not something that's just like a knee-jerk reaction based on something, a belief that, that they have that might just be very superficial. Yeah, which is unfortunately where most, you know, comes from. But when you meet the person who, who cares enough to hone a piece of writing so that you say, gee, I would like to have written that myself, but for the fact that I don't agree with that perspective. Um, and it ain't easy to do, you know, it, it ain't easy to do, but, but it, 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 it's, it's a tonic, it's a tonic to the intellect. It's a tonic to the psyche. So I want people to find those things they disagree with, but they got to be good things and, and, and really solid and valuable things. And they're out there. We should talk a little bit about positive thought and the Miracle Club and those kinds of works. Yeah. Um, I had a book that came out this summer called Daydream Believer, which is very personally important to me. And in it, I try to probe the gaps in the positive mind tradition, philosophy, and new thought, uh, which is now close to 150 years old. And I I have a, a deep attachment to new thought because I... I love the premise that thoughts are causative, and I love the articles for experiment that that gives the individual outside of any dogma or doctrine. But I also do believe that uh, new thought at a certain point really stopped growing, uh, probably after the death of William James in 1910, who referred to it as the religion of healthy mindedness. There were other figures who came after James including Neville Goddard, who I love very, very deeply, who I think did help the, the philosophy grow. But New Thought never developed a theology of suffering. Uh, it never developed a persuasive response uh, to tragedy, to catastrophe, either on an intimate scale or a macro scale. And, and yet its pioneers, its practitioners did have a wonderful instinct for things that are now common parlance, like the placebo effect or the power of suggestion or findings that are emerging from neuroplasticity or ideas that are coming out of the hard sciences and theoretical attempts to grapple with them, like string theory and, and the many worlds theory within uh, particle physics and such. And New Thought, in its formation, had an incredible instinct for this material. And I, I, I do have an abiding love for some of this popular literature because I think it reaches the individual where he or she lives and, and again, gives you possibilities for experimentation that don't require signing up for anything. And I love that. And yet the philosophy has its gaps. And I try to wrestle with that very acutely and directly and daydream believer. One of the gaps is that the formula that's often employed in the positive mind model or, or the new thought model is that you have to assume the feeling state of the wish fulfilled, and that will enact these presumed causative uh, properties of thought. 
And I have an issue with that because, of course, very few of us, if any, have the capacity to alter our emotional state at moments of acute crisis. If a person is grieving or suffering anxiety or deeply depressed or perhaps legitimately afraid of something, asking that person to alter his or her feeling state can almost be like Mother Nature playing a cruel joke on us. You can have what you want, but first you have to change your emotions to suit the desired thing. And for people in a state of crisis, that can prove impossible. So one of the things I've been experimenting with and one of the things I write about in Daydream Believer is if, if I'm persuaded that the mind has causative agencies, and I am persuaded of that, and I argue for that in the book, and I'm very detailed about why I believe that, then armed with that foreknowledge, is it possible, is it possible that just the wish itself is sufficient from whatever emotional state you're in, is the wish itself sufficient to enact these agencies? Is it possible to dispense with some of the methodology and the, the ceremony that has developed around some of this? And that's something I've been experimenting with. That's among the reasons why I'm so deeply interested in psychical research, ESP research, for example, because some of that intersects with this question. And if if I'm if I have a warranted belief, a warranted belief that the mind possesses extra physical qualities, that opens up possibilities to me that can be acted on from almost any state, uh, almost any outlook or situation. So that's something that I've been experimenting with. That's kind of where my search is at right now with respect to mind metaphysics. That's wonderful. I gave a talk a few years ago, I think it was at our second uh, psycho cult conference in Italy, rewriting the future. And I talked about the, the crusade against magical thinking. And I love that you love that thoughts are causative because in that tech, when I was writing that paper, I looked up like, what is the actual like definition according to like the psychiatrist of like what magical thinking is? And that's exactly what it is. Like the idea that your thoughts uh, can cause changes in the world. <laughs> yeah. Like, how depressing is it that, that, that people don't think that? Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> How do you think, think all of society was created? You know? Right, 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 right. I, I think that there are certain terms emergent from uh, the social sciences that have become overused tropes. Magical thinking is one. Uh, confirmation bias is one. Law of large numbers is one. These ideas come too readily to the lips, and they're used to take away experiences from people. and if followed through on to their ultimate extent, it almost limits self-inquiry to credentialed study. So everyone from Lao Tzu to Sylvia Plath is just engaged in confirmation bias, you know, and, and, and it's insufficient. It's insufficient to the human experience and it degrades the human experience because it suggests that we're incapable of thinking outside these boxes. And I, I, I reject that. And there's so much evidence, it seems to me, uh, that supports rejecting that. Yeah, and it's like uh, it's like boiling things down to like the material, and then pretending like like as if we are only like ourselves and our you know physical matter, or you know the idea of like a, what's the difference between a house and a home? It's like they're only looking at like the structure of the house and not like the feeling of the home or what that means or symbolizes. And they're saying that anybody that does look at those more poetic aspects or magical aspects of life is like you know, uh, lost the plot. Yeah. And there's a, there's at once a brutality and a naivete to deploying these terms, uh, unthoughtfully and look to cite a, a field that is not at all controversial, neuroplasticity within the field of neuroplasticity. We can see from brain scans that sustain thoughts, whatever thought is, I mean, that's another question of its own, but sustained thoughts alter brain chemistry, alter the neural pathways through which electrical impulses travel in the brain. So is that magical thinking? Because in that instance, thoughts are changing reality, actual biological reality, and we can track it through brain scans. So there's so many holes in that idea of magical thinking 
uh, these things can't just be deployed as as slogans, not if one wants to have a real exchange. Yeah, and something else you talk about that I find so useful and I'm actively practicing at the moment um, that I think is from the Miracle Club when you talk about, you know, when you decide something you want to change in your life, you know, you have to kind of really focus on it intently uh, in a consistent way and also say no to things that don't align with that, with what you're searching for and yes. that practice of saying no. And it's amazing how many things then like pop up that you, and that at least I recently have had to say no to because I'm like, this is not what I want to be doing. I know that. And it's like so tem tempting, like, oh, but we'll give you this money for it or whatever and I'm just like no that's not what I want to be doing I have to stick with what I really want long term and that's where the rubber hits the road you know where somebody for example may be offering money and saying hey I want you to you know do this and whatever that is doesn't build the thing that I'm after so at that point what do I do do I suffer the consequence of saying no to the money do I need the money you know am I thinking about it clearly but when simple ideas are applied, that's where the profundity appears. And, and I always tell people, I dig simple ideas for that very reason. First of all, we very rarely act on them. Uh, we love to talk about ideas, but, but very rarely do we commit to them in, in application. And when we do, that's when things get really heavy. So someone says, you know, don't lie. And we all agree, right, lying is bad. But if you really try to apply that to life, it puts you in front of tremendous questions. Absolutely. Is there anything that you wanted to get to that we didn't cover yet? Well, I'm excited for our upcoming workshop and dialogue. Um, gosh, uh, I'm teaching a, a class in February on parapsychology with the Theosophical Society. That's a, a four-part online class. And people can find out about that on my website, mitchhorowitz.com or on my social media. And I'm excited about that. That is gonna be four sessions where we really get deep into uh, the evidence for extra physicality, ESP, telepathy, so forth, and address some of the problems and issues and the question of where all this is going, as well as potential applications. That sounds exciting. I also had to bring up something that you mentioned at the beginning that I have to follow up because you you would know. You mentioned the UFO uh, being on the cover of the paper yeah. in relation to the Pentagon. And I feel like it was such a blip because there was so much going on in the world. Um, and what's happened with that? Like, where did that go or what's going on? Uh, oh, well, in October of last year, the Pentagon was supposed to issue a follow-up report and we're all sitting around waiting for that. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's obviously going to be the subject of a lot of debate whenever it comes out. For all I know, maybe it'll come out this afternoon. You know, I have, I have no idea, but no one knows. There was a follow-up article in the Times by a writer named Julian Barnes, who gave a preview of the report. And in, in, in Barnes's preview, which I refer to as the Empire Strikes Back, uh, there's all this uh, uh, dissuasion of the idea that this report is going to uncover anything uh, revelatory, but Barnes quotes strictly from anonymous sources. And when Leslie Keen, Ralph Blumenthal, and Helene Cooper were doing their article, one of the things Leslie told me is that uh, they were under very strict guidelines from their editors that Every name had to be on record. There could be no anonymous sources in this piece. And they followed through, of course. But here comes this counter piece based on almost strictly anonymous sources. So, you know, you can already see the dividing lines uh, shaping up. But those reporters, uh, uh, Keen, Blumenthal, and Cooper, uh, they did extraordinary work in, in placing the UFO thesis into the mainstream and the genie can't be put back in the bottle. So <laughs> that's what we face. Yeah, my mom's father, he was very high up in the Air Force. Uh, he was a pilot, a bomber pilot during World War II and flew like more than 50 missions, like bombing Nazis. And um, when the Bay of Pigs happened, he's like, because we're from Florida, he had, he had like the red phone on the desk in his office and he was the person in charge of like clearing the airspace for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was pretty high up. And according to her, she said that he would always say that it was just like common knowledge and like 
knew that the Air Force was working with them and like it wasn't even a secret once you're at a certain level, I guess. How fascinating. I think that point of view prevails among the public today. And of course, uh, popularity is not validation, but the fact that most of the public, I think, in the Western world uh, is open to this question or more than open, uh, is committed in its belief, you know, as you were just describing, I think it means that, that we are on a kind of generational precipice. And this question, I believe, is going to keep growing.